My next guest who I'm about to announce, when I heard his story, I just simply didn't believe it. And I had to cross check it about five times because I really didn't believe it. Nice Jewish kid from St. Louis, you know, who gets a $300 million weapon contract. Let's jump in. David Packhouse, welcome to the Armchair NBA. How are you doing today, buddy? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So we're going to jump in, talk a little bit about your background. Tell us about your formative years and kind of, you know, what makes you, you? <laughs> well, everything makes me me, right? As, as it does us all. But um, I was born in St. Louis, as you mentioned, but uh, only lived there for a few weeks. So I, I can't say, I can't claim to be a real St. Louis native. Uh, grew up in Israel in Jerusalem until I was eight oh. years old and oh, then wow. moved to Miami and okay. lived there more or less ever since. So more of a Miami native uh, uh, than anything. Though uh, my parents, my family is uh, are Orthodox Jews, so a bit different than the general Miami culture. Uh, I grew up in a very different uh, style and, and uh, community than the than what most people think of Miami. Um, and uh, yeah, I I uh, live there. I've st I'm still living in Miami. I'm living in North Miami now, nice. and. Um, uh, I, I don't know how much how much detail you. Why not? I mean, just kind of just whatever you're comfortable sharing. My question is, yeah. I guess what comes to mind is, you know, in New York and New Jersey, certain areas, if you're, you know, Orthodox, an mm -hmm. Orthodox Jew, you typically live in a big, you know, in a community like yeah. this, Monsey, New York, and so forth. Yes. Um, um, was there a community like that in, in, in uh, Miami? Definitely not like Monsey. I mean, Monsey yeah. is a very, very famous, yeah. large Orthodox community. Yeah. Um, Miami, I grew up in Miami beach, um, okay, no. and Miami beach actually has had, has a long history of, of Jews and in general and Orthodox Jews as well, okay. uh, living there. Uh, so our, our Orthodox Jews, anyone who knows about the, uh, uh, about the culture, they're very kind of insular. Yeah. So, uh, I only knew other Jews growing up, other Orthodox Jews in particular growing up. I went to an all Orthodox Jewish, uh, uh school. Uh, an Orthodox Jewish uh, only male school, so I didn't even uh, yeah. get to to meet girls of the same faith. Mm -hmm. But so it's very insular, very um, very conservative, I guess you could call it, um, and very different than the standard Miami culture. It's kind of funny. My my school was right next to uh, South Beach, okay. so there was like a real dichotomy of of uh, I went to a very religious, uh, very conservative school, but like a few blocks away from all the clubs and all the partying and all the festivals and everything happening in South Beach. And, and they, they kept us real busy studying Bible all day to make sure yeah. that we uh, didn't have any time whatsoever to walk a few blocks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> South and, and, and join uh, all the heathens as they would call us. So, I love it. I yeah. love it. I yeah. love it. So, you know, you had a good upbringing, you're doing your thing. And yeah. um, what kind of interests me about your story, especially mm -hmm. early on is, you know, you're a massage therapist in, in, in Miami, mm -hmm. and then you get into the gun trade. So, like, yeah. how do you, walk me through that. Yeah. Uh, so I got into um, – when I was about 20 years old, I, I left the faith. Uh, I became uh, secular, okay. and um, I had a whole philosophical falling out, and that's a yeah. whole other story. But yeah. uh, um, I was going to college to study chemistry, and I realized that I needed to – pay the bills and uh, massage was a great way to do it because I had gotten massage therapy for myself. I had whiplash and I was yeah. I had been injured. And so I, I got introduced to massage therapy that way. And I realized that it made a lot more money than, uh, than flipping burgers, yeah. so, which all my friends were doing at the time. And I was like, I'm not going to be wasting mm -hmm. my life flipping burgers. So, uh, and, and massage therapy only took six months to get a, a license to get certified by the state yeah. uh, to be able to do it legally as a medical practitioner, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, so it wasn't such a huge investment. And then I was making $75, $100 an hour instead of like five, $7 an hour, which most yeah. people are making at, at, you know, at my age. And I was studying chemistry. I had doing a few other businesses. I was importing electronics from China. I was importing uh, mostly SD cards. Yeah. And it started getting into, uh, I was selling them on eBay and, yeah. and other places. And I got into uh, selling bed sheets and towels to nursing homes and yes. hospitals. Yes. Um, 
remember that. And, yeah, that made it into the film, yeah. <laughs> though in a very different way than how it actually happened. But yeah, that's that's Hollywood. They usually change things. Of course. And uh, doing pretty well. I was pretty comfortable. Yeah. Mainly focused, though, on putting myself through school and, and graduating with my chemistry degree. Yeah. And then I bumped into uh, an old friend of mine who I had known growing up. We Our families had gone to the same synagogue and neither of us liked to pray. So yeah. we would sneak out during prayers and hang <laughs> out in basketball courts. I love it. And uh, that's how I met Ephraim Devaroli, who in the Ooh, film okay. is played by uh, Jonah Hill. And uh, and he had been in the in the arms trade for a few years. He'd gotten into it uh, by working for his uncle. His uncle uh, he had gotten kicked out of school for for smoking weed, and they sent him off to his uncle to work as a uh, to work in his warehouse, you know, as like a punishment. Yeah. And he got obsessed with guns. He just got totally obsessed and started learning all about guns. He started buying used guns on the on the on the secondhand uh, market and selling them at a profit under his uncle's name because he was like 16 years old when he started. Yeah. And he got really into the gun trade, uh, into the into the commercial gun trade, I should say, uh, by working for for his uncle. His uncle also was selling to. Uh, weapons, ammunition, uh, bulletproof vests, things of that nature, accessories to the um, to the local police and the state police of California. His uncle was based in South Central LA, yeah. and uh, and so that's how he learned how to bid on government contracts to uh, to um, do competitive bidding to supply the government with uh, with equipment. Yeah. And he had a falling out with his uncle. Uh, they both claimed the other screwed him. And no, that works. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and Ephraim uh, moved back to Miami, started his own company. Or I should say he took over a company that his dad had started because he was still too. I think he was like almost not even 18 when he moved back to Miami. So he couldn't start his own company, but he took over the an entity that his dad had not been using for a few years called okay. AEY Inc. Um, so that. <laughs> yeah, which makes, that makes it into the film. Uh, unlike what they say in the film, AEY does actually stand for something. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's the initials of uh, three of his father's sons. So it's Avrami, Ephraim, and Yeshaya. Ephraim, Ephraim, the E is the E in AEY. So yeah, it's it's the initials of three of his sons' names. Um, so he he took over that corporate structure and started and registered it with the federal government and started bidding on federal contracts. And this was in 2004. During right the after, Afghan conflict. Yeah. 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 It was right after the, the Iraq uh, uh, war, right after Saddam was taken down and, and the United States was occupying Iraq. Yeah. And the goal was to build a, a uh, democratic government in Iraq. And so they had just bombed the country and they had to rebuild the whole thing. So they had a massive amounts of contracts. I think they spent something like one or $2 trillion on it and, and by the end. Yeah, it was like an insane wow. amount of money. And they were, they were buying everything. I mean, they were buying air conditioning units, food, yeah. they were buying, and they also had to buy lots of weapons and ammunition to supply the uh, new Iraq. Yeah, please. Yeah, police. No, of course, yeah. 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 So he, he of course, was v very well versed in the ammunition and weapons market from his yeah. time working for his uncle. And so he started bidding on these contracts and he was very, very t uh, talented negotiator. He really knew how to find people's bottom line and yeah. and uh, worked very hard and got a lot of good sourcing price sources. And he was very competitive. So he started winning a lot of contracts started nice. making a decent amount of money. And after about a year, that was when we bumped into each other. And he, he told me, and he, he, you know, he asked me what I was doing. And I told yeah. him about the bed sheets and about the electronics. <laughs> and he was like, Oh, you're doing pretty much what I'm doing. Yeah. But, uh, I'm doing it on a way big, bigger scale, you know, just like sourcing and, and international logistics. Yeah. And stuff. So, you know, I really need a guy who I could trust, who's smart, uh, who works hard and, uh, you know, like, would you like to come work with me? Yeah. And I, I, you know, I had no idea what exactly he was doing at the time. Yeah. And I asked him, well, you know, how much money are you making? Right. Yeah. And he's like, well, it's complicated. I owe people money. People owe me money. I'm like, well, what do you have right now? 
Yeah. And he opened up his computer and he logged into his account and he's like, I'm only going to show this to you to inspire you. So yeah. uh, I'm not bragging here. And, and he showed me his bank account and he had $1.8 million right. of cash. And he was 18 years old at the time. Oof. So it, it just blew my mind. I was like, wow, I knew this guy had, you know, he, his parents didn't give him that money. So yeah, gonna say, he obviously yeah. knew how to run some business and yeah. be very successful at it. So uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, you obviously know what you're doing and I would love to learn how to make that kind of money. I mean, I was doing all right, but not that well. Yeah. And, um, and so, so we started and that's how I got into it. Now, one thing I found interesting though is, um, you got some contracts and you got bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually getting a $300 yeah. million dollar contract, which we'll get to. Yeah. But you guys got, you know, cause you need finance, you know, this, you have yeah. to, you have to acquire the parts sure. or yeah. finish goods and the government pays late. So you need capital. Right. Yes. So you guys had an, an investor who happened to be, you know, pro Israeli Jewish investor. And you're like, Hey, listen, yeah. we need some money, but you, yeah. you guys kind of got the money saying, Hey, we're going to only give, you know, arms, that have to do with protecting Israel, but then you wind up selling them to the Afghanis. Is there any truth to that? I kind of did I read that right? So in the film, that's what they say, right? Got it. Uh, yeah. They they actually change the character. So it, you're okay. talking about Ralph, right? In in the film, yeah. he's our investor, the, the character named Ralph. And yeah. in the film, he's a um he's a Jewish laundromat owner in Miami. Uh, in reality, he was, yeah, <laughs> in reality, he was actually a Mormon based in Utah and, okay. he owned, and he owned a machine gun factory. Oh, so okay. he, he was, he was more involved in the business than they, they portrayed in the film. Uh, he it. was our investor and the way Ephraim met him through his father, his father had done some business with him yeah. and he got introduced to him that way. And uh, Ephraim needed a, a, you know, when he first started, he needed someone to finance his deals. And he came yeah. to Ralph and said, Hey, look, I've got, it wasn't like a large amount. It was, I mean, relatively uh yeah. it was like a hundred thousand dollars or yeah. something the contract and ralph uh you know saw that he had won a legitimate u.s government contract so that's as as safe as as a customer as it gets is the u.s right. government because you know they're going to pay their bills as long as right. you deliver. you know they're not going to go bankrupt or anything because yeah, they're the exactly. ones taking the money right uh so um so ralph said yeah you know like if you you have he saw he had the source he saw he had the contract he just yeah. needed the money to float the contract yeah. and so ralph put up the money and Ephraim Ephraim gave him his cut and ralph was thrilled and ralph said yeah sure you know we can keep on doing this for future contracts if you need financing let me know yeah. and then ralph started introducing him to his connections in the gun business um, and that's how actually we met uh, Henry Tomei, who is played by Bradley Cooper in the film. Yeah. In, in the movie, they we, they make it look like we just bumped into him randomly. That's not yeah, how yeah, yeah. Uh, Ralph actually had done business with Henry in the 90s. Got it. Got it. Um, and so we had a long relationship with him. And he introduced uh, Henry to, to Ephraim. And that, that's how we got one of our best sources for arms uh, over there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it had, it didn't really, I mean, Ralph is a devout Christian. He's not a Jew. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, Christians do feel, a, a, a um, I, I don't know if a loyalty is the right word, but they do feel, um, some sort of, a, a alliance allegiance with, with the state of Israel. So he was definitely pro Israel, but, yeah. uh, that wasn't, it wasn't really a big yeah. generation. Yeah. It was, it Got was it. just something that they threw in, in the film. Got it. Now, like, like you kind of touched on this, and and also in my research, I saw that the strategy was, and again, it sounds weird to us civilians, but not weird for the government contracts. Yes. You know, five million dollar government contract is is not that big. Some of the big companies will spend more money trying to get it than even servicing it. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. focusing on these big dollar these big dollar contracts. Right. So you guys started building by getting you know some million dollar contracts. Correct. But eventually, you guys escalated to a three hundred million dollar contract tell me how you got it yeah. and what was your you know first visceral reaction when you heard that you guys got it right so yeah as as you said uh the way the government works is that they take um they take several uh, uh 
factors into account before they award a contract. Price uh, is obviously a major component. They want to spend as little money as possible. Uh, but they also take into account um, what they call uh, past performance, which yeah. is your history of delivering similar items uh, yeah. either to the government or to other commercial entities. You yeah. have to, if you can prove that you've done this business, they, they have a higher level of trust that you're going to succeed with delivering the contract. Correct. Um, and as well as financial uh, capability, they want yeah. to be able to see that you can finance it. Yeah. Uh, so, so they the bigger the contract, the the more they investigate to, and the more weight they put on those other factors because it, the bigger the contract, the more important it is that that uh, supplier is reliable rather than just the cheapest. Correct. So correct. the way the way it works is you most contractors they start off with the smaller contracts usually if something under a hundred thousand dollars they don't even take past performance into account so you could win as a brand new company with no history you could win contracts under a hundred thousand and start building up a a um a reputation in that way you build up your past performance and then you can go for bigger and bigger contracts sure. uh, so after about nine eight nine months or, or so of working together uh, when after i started we had we bid on a contract that ended up being worth, we didn't know it at the time when we, when we first started working on it, but it ended up being worth about $300 million. And that was, uh, that was by like about 20 times bigger than anything we'd ever done. Holy cow. And, um, and it was, uh, it was the, the idea of this contract was it was to supply the entire Afghan army and police with all the munitions they'd need for like the next few decades. <laughs> so it was, it was, it wasn't actually weapons. It was just munitions. So it was it. bullets, uh, yeah, yeah. uh anti-aircraft rockets, uh, tank shells, things of did that. Did you shit before. when you got it? Like, like, what, like, what did you like? like I know you're obviously excited. Yeah. Yeah. For dreaming, but then you're like, yeah. shit, we got to fulfill this. Yeah, no, we were terrified. <laughs> we were excited but terrified at the same time. It was uh, um, we didn't actually think we would win. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. It was a total like a hail mary, as they as they call it. You know, nice. we knew that we technically uh, um, qualified to bid on it because we had the past performance in way yeah. way smaller quantities. We had delivered similar types of munitions to uh, to Iraq. Yeah. and some other places. Uh, so we had the past performance to prove that we could do this, but it was such a huge contract. And we knew that all the big companies were bidding on this. We knew that that General Dynamics was bidding on it. ATK yeah. was bidding on it. These huge multi-billion dollar public companies yeah. with like a staff of 150 people yeah, all yeah, working yeah. on this thing. So um, we were like, there's no way we're actually going to win this, but we have yeah. to try. It was, yeah. it was, never know. the reward was so big that we had to give it a shot. Yeah. So, but we didn't think we would win. So when we when I first found out, I, I remember um, Ephraim, Ephraim called me up and he's like, uh, you know, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And I said, well, what's the bad news? And he said, well, the first task order is only 600 K. And what that means, a task, the way the government works is they give you a contract, which is like worth three hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah. But they, yeah. they do it in pieces, right? Called task yeah. orders. So they yeah. won't like order $300 million worth of stuff all at once. They'll be right, like right. this month, you know, give me $10 million worth next month. Give me 30. They give correct. you like specific orders yeah. and they're actually not legally required to order the entire amount. They are only legally required to order the first task order with the award the contract so it was a debate for us because we we're like are they really because these numbers are so enormous we've never seen anything so big yeah. we we're like are they actually serious about doing this or is this one of those things that they're going to change their minds and and you know uh, uh cancel it after like a one or two task orders correct and so we bid it with the idea that they were going to order the entire amount and then that had a big effect on the price because the shipping was only going to be that cheap if we ordered that many aircraft. Yeah, it's, 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 it's economies of scale. If you're going to exactly. order six exactly. million units from me, I'll do it for a dollar. Exactly. If you order six hundred thousand, it's going to be yeah. five bucks. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's a very big difference uh, in the in our cost of logistics, depending on how much they would end up ordering. So we knew that it was a risk to to bid on these prices because if they right. ordered a small amount, we'd kind of be screwed. Yeah. Uh, we would have no way to profitably deliver. So right. when they gave us the contract and they gave us a first task order of six hundred k, which is like nothing. I mean, 
And that's yeah. not even enough to fill up one aircraft load. Yeah. We were like, oh, fuck, we better get a second task order soon or, or correct, screwed. Correct, 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 so correct. it was kind of like super exciting, but super yeah. nerve wracking. Now, too. really, really quick, uh, David. So, so just so I, I want to fully wrap my head around it. You know, yeah. they ordered 600,000 in phones, right? Yeah. And, and you had your pricing schedule. So yeah. basically, that was a loss leader, that order based off of what you quoted them. And, so, and I, yeah. Yeah. So we had to we had to uh, honor the price of uh, for the individual items, no matter how much they ordered. It was a single Ooh. price for each item. It wasn't tiered. Ouch. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we were so nervous about it, because. Uh, you know, if they only gave us that first task order, then we would not be able to deliver without losing a lot of money. And yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we would default on the contract, and then they would give us a, a very nasty black mark on our record. It'd be difficult to win other contracts. Yeah, so that's yeah. what we're concerned. Got it. So, but real quick though, so like now, I'm guessing you guys were more brokers, right? You weren't. I don't. Yeah. you were making the munitions. You had your Correct. vendors. So yeah. you go to your vendors, like. Yeah. Would you go to them and say, hey, listen, we have a really large contract. You know, here's our first task order. You know, hey, we need you to go down a little bit so we could float this. Or they don't give a shit because they're so big. You're so small. Like, how did those come? Because obviously, you guys right. are smart guys. Ephraim's a right. creator. How did yeah. you guys kind of work through it? Right. So, so it depends on the vendor, right? Yeah. So if you're talking to a vendor that's based in the United States and they're a large company and they are used to giving people credit terms, yeah. then you could do that. If you have good credit you know, if you're personally and your company has good credit, then you could apply for credit from the vendor and they will hopefully approve you for credit. And then, you know, they'll give you 30, 60 day credit terms and then you just deliver to the, to the government yeah, and the government on. pays you 30 days after you deliver and Correct. you don't even need the money to finance it. Yeah. But the vast majority, or at least the contracts that we were doing, uh, was all foreign ammunition. It was all Warsaw packed ammo. It wasn't. It wasn't ammunition for the M16. It was ammunition yeah. for the AK47. Yeah. And that stuff, by and large, is not manufactured in the United States. So we had to get it overseas. And no overseas company is going to give you credit terms. That's, you know, they, they don't. Yeah. Give you yeah, it's not like the local yeah. AR15 is exactly. a Kalashnikov or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You, oh man, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So you. So we needed to finance it because they require payment before shipping in 100% payment before it ships. So you can go and inspect it, but they won't release the goods until the money's in their account. Wow. So we, we needed and to float this deal. And that was like one of the big challenges we had. Yeah. You know, uh, um, you know, going into the deal, because after they, they told us what, you know, that they were considering to award us the contract before awarding us the contract. But they wanted to do this like really in-depth um, audit of our capabilities. Yeah. And one of the they had several audits of you know, financing uh, uh, of the financing of the accounting system of our of our uh, proposed sources. So they had a, a lot of things that they were looking into. But the financing was something that, you know, we needed a lot of financing for this contract. And so we had Ralph and he had a you know, few million dollars. We also Ephraim had a few million dollars as well. And okay. then we got made a deal with the bank to um to uh, for a factoring agreement, and that's oh, how. Nice. We, so, so you're uh, you're. I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with very factoring. Factor. Using yeah. invoicing to get the financing. Exactly. Credit. So the great thing about factoring is that with the bank, we actually used Wells Fargo. Uh, we we had a deal with them that as soon as the U.S. government signs off on the receiving documents then that the goods were delivered, they would uh, they would finance the value of that invoice. Uh, so we don't have to wait another thirty days. To oh get wow. It by the government. So we'd get the money immediately from Wells Fargo and Beautiful. then we could roll it into the ne to the next aircraft. Yeah. So instead of having all this, all this sounds great. Right. And I, and, and like, like, you know, for those that are watching and are in business and, and that kind of stuff, <laughs> all this stuff sounds great. At this point, David is like, great. Am I going to get my condo in Malibu, yeah. you know, or, you know, Kauai, you know, okay, right. so, exactly. so what if, but that's not how life works. So what happened next? No. <laughs> yeah. 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 Unfortunately not. Yeah, I was, I was really looking forward to those uh, millions of dollars that, that I thought were coming my way. Yeah. But uh, Ephraim uh, just didn't feel that uh, he wanted to pay me. So after, after everything was set up and going, you know, the aircraft were going on a regular basis, uh, you know, he, and he didn't really need me, you know, so much anymore. 
um, then he was like, oh, I, I don't think you're really pulling your weight in the company. I, right. you, know, I, you know, why don't we, instead of that deal we made where you get supposed to get 25% of the, of the profits, yeah. uh, why don't we just make you like an officer of the company? You'll get a flat $100,000 a year salary. And, you know, 100 grand a year is not a bad salary, but yeah, I was supposed to make, yeah. not when you're supposed to make $15 million. Yeah. So I, I told him, no way, I'm not accepting that. And he's like, well, take it or leave it. And I said, well, I'm going to leave it and I'll see you in court. So that's mm -hmm. that's how my uh, my uh, time with uh, AEY and F from the So, so what, what's, um, and part of the show is always try to unpack things and, and give learnings, Yeah. you know, especially when you have a friend like, yeah. did you have a sound contract? He didn't honor it, or right. were you loosey goosey, willy nilly, right. on paper because he was your friend? You know, right. Give us a learning that you got from it. Right. So both of those things, oddly. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, it was just—I mean, we had all our previous deals. It was just a, a verbal agreement. Yeah. We never had any like signed contracts. Yeah. And and he and kind of fun. I should have seen it coming because. Every time we would successfully complete a contract and yeah. it was owed money, he would be like, oh, but we have this other contract that's coming up and we need financing for that. So why don't we just roll your cut into the financing of the next contract? Yeah. And so I never actually got paid for anything because he kept on rolling it into the next contract to oh, finance. And, and he was like, oh, it's only fair. I'm using my money to finance the contract. You have money now, so you should finance the contract with me. And I was like, well, I guess that makes sense. Um, and and so similar thing with the with the Afghan. So by the time the Afghan deal rolled around, I was like, okay, you know, over here, you know, because he kept on trying to change the terms of the deal. It was like, you know, are we talking about your sources or my sources? The whole thing, and it was like a whole thing. And I was like, you know what? Let's just write everything down. So we had we came to an agreement. We wrote it down. We both signed it. It was just like a handwritten piece, single yeah. piece of paper, no lawyers involved. Yeah. And I had it on my desk. Um, it, they show this in the film, right? Mm -hmm. I actually tried to make a scan of it. Uh, I had a you know scanner, uh, but my scanner was glitching for some uh, reason. It didn't work. Uh, and so I was unable to make a scan of it. And then like a few days later, it just disappeared. Of course it did. And like, like, and shortly after that, he informed me he didn't think I deserved to get paid what we had agreed on. And of course, I couldn't find the contract anymore. In, in, um, in your estimation, sorry, go ahead. David. Yeah, no, and, and he was the only one who had access to, he was the only one who could have removed that contract. And I looked everywhere for it. So, yeah. In your estimation, how much did you lose that on? I hate to be the, yeah, rub it in, but how much did you lose that on? Well, if if we had delivered on the entire three hundred million dollar contract, which didn't end up happening because of you know the the legal issues that that uh, came up with it, but if we had delivered on three hundred million dollar contract, I would have made my my you know the total profit would have been about sixty million dollars, and I would have gotten twenty five percent of that, so fifteen million dollars. Jesus Christ! Yeah. So yeah. so his rationale was just like, hey, I'd rather hold on to more of it and screw you or, or did he have a drug problem? Did he like, what was kind of his motivation? Well, he did have a drug problem, but that didn't really have anything to do with, with him yeah. screwing me over. I mean, he just, that was just unfortunately how he operated. Um, and I, and from what I hear still operates, uh, he, uh, he, he was a, he was very good at negotiating, yeah. but he would never stop negotiating. Got so it. he always tried, like, even when you came to an agreement with him, he would try to renegotiate later. Yeah. Uh, so, and he did this to everyone. And that's why I feel so dumb today because I'm like, I saw him do this to other people. I, you know, why did I think I was any different? I mean, yeah, I was his best friend, so to speak, but apparently he doesn't really have friends. Um, it, it, it's kind of, it makes sense to me, but I spoke to, so Ephraim actually came up with, uh, while he was in, he went to prison for four years and he wrote a book with a, he had a ghostwriter in prison, a guy named Matthew Cox. Matthew. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, it's funny. I saw him on concrete and then I oh, saw yeah. you right like the next day or very yeah, shortly yeah. thereafter. Yeah. So Matt was Deveroli's ghostwriter in prison. And Matt said he had told Danny on concrete, uh, Danny told me yeah. uh, that, um, 
that when he was tell when he was talking to Ephraim and he re you know he was talking about all like his history and how Ephraim kept on screwing over pretty much everybody he ever yeah. worked with. Uh, uh, Matt goes to him, you know, you can't really keep on burning every bridge yeah. uh, in life. And Ephraim, in his Ephraim's response, which made total sense to me considering his history, he goes to him, Matt. There's a lot of bridges out there. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but yeah, Jesus yeah. So yeah. so. Okay, so wow, there's a lot to unpack there, but okay, so how, what did Ephraim get tripped up for with jail? What did he do wrong? Right, so we both um, got tripped up uh, in the sense that uh, the AK-47 ammo that we had sourced from Albania uh, turned out to have originally been from China. Uh, and there was, and it was very specific in our contract that we couldn't deliver Chinese ammunition Originally, they had done, they had put it in there because of the Tiananmen Square massacre, and the, the there was an arms embargo placed against uh, China due yeah. to the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. Yeah. So it's illegal for U.S. citizens to buy and sell military equipment with Chinese companies, and so they put in the contract that no Chinese ammunition could be supplied under this contract. Uh, they didn't say Chinese ammunition that violated the embargo, but yeah. they just said Chinese ammunition. Period. Um, now. We, when we discovered that the Albanian ammunition had originally come from China, we realized that it had come from China in the 70s while it was still legal before yeah. there was this embargo. So there was kind of a question in our mind, is it legal or is it not to deliver? Because it didn't violate the terms of the embargo, but it did violate the terms of our contract because our contract didn't mention the embargo, it just said no Chinese ammo, period. Yeah. So we had, we had a, you know, a debate amongst ourselves. You know, we had we could either go to the army and to the U.S. Army and say, hey, look, you know, I know that our contract with you says no Chinese ammo, but this ammo that we found doesn't violate the terms of the embargo. Um, yeah. I'm sure you put that in there because of the embargo. So can we get an exemption? Can we get a waiver uh, for this? And they could have said, yeah, that makes sense here. We really need that ammo. Here's here's a waiver. Or they could have said, well, you know, everyone in the industry bid this contract under these terms that no Chinese ammo period yeah. would be allowed. So it's technically not fair to all the competitors that that you won this contract right. and bid this, this ammo that they couldn't. And then they might have to take away our $300 million contract, yes. which we really didn't want to lose. So Ephraim made the decision. I mean, he made all final decisions, yeah. uh, you know, after we discussed it, that he was willing to roll the dice and just not tell the army about it and just deliver. And in order to increase our, uh, uh, our chances of getting away with it, so to speak, um, we would repackage all the ammo into into cardboard boxes and remove any Chinese papers markings. Or, yeah, that would that were packed with the ammunition. And so we hired someone to do that and to do a whole repackaging operation. And eventually, the guy who we hired to do the repackaging operation uh, got pushed out by the local uh, mobsters in Albania because they wanted the money uh, to do the repackaging operation. Ephraim was fine with it because he got offered a slightly better deal on the ammo and uh, and and screwed the box guy over for like $20,000 because he got $20,000 worth of boxes he couldn't use. Box guy got really pissed and went it up and, and told the New York Times about the whole thing told the Justice Department about it, told the Albanian Jesus media about Christ. it. And that's how the whole thing kind of came apart. Um, because the actually the army knew for like six months after, uh, you know, after, um, uh, before they canceled the contract, they knew that we were delivering Chinese ammo, but they didn't, they didn't end up actually caring about it. They, because the ammo was fine, it was working and they yeah. needed it. But they, uh, the the Justice Department, which has different motivations than the U.S. Army, they need, you know, the Justice Department just wants the the notches on their belt, so to Correct. speak, uh, you know, for taking people down. The Justice Department tried to get the Army to cancel the contract. The Army refused without a letter from the Attorney General. Attorney General never never gave that letter. Don't yeah. know why, but he just never did. Yeah. And so, so the Army just kept on getting deliveries for another six months until the New York Times published a front page article about us that was very unflattering. And then there was a big political blowback and, and um, the army suddenly pretended like they had no idea the whole time and they canceled the contract and the Justice Department charged us with fraud. So wow. that's, you know, that's how that went down. So then he, yeah. um, he got four years. Yeah, yeah, he here's, got where, 
Yeah. Whereas here's where I get like I'm always big on lanes, right? So like yeah. if you're the if you're the principal and yeah. you're entitled to that 15 million or whatever that is, yeah, you know what? Right, but it's like you didn't get your money or really get right. all of your money, and you were on the hook, right? right. Like, how does that work? <laughs> so originally, uh, originally, they actually didn't. They told me that they weren't planning on um, on uh, charging me at all with any crime. Yeah. They're planning on charging Diveroli because he was like the ringleader. He made was yeah. the one making all the money. He made all the decisions. Um, and they didn't want to charge me or my friend Alex, who we had sent to Albania to do the repackaging. Uh, they weren't planning on charging us uh, you know, because we, because I mean, neither of us were working with Devaroli anymore. Yeah. Devaroli had just screwed me out of fifteen million dollars, so uh, <laughs> so I couldn't like afford to, buy, you know, to fight them in court. And so correct, I was like, correct. whatever, you know, I'll I'll just yeah. tell you the truth, and yeah. what, it is what it is. I'll take I'll take what you know what happens, but. Um, so they said, well, you, you know, we're really just going for Diveroli, so we, we're not planning on charging you with anything. And I said, great. Wow. <laughs> and then the New York Times article got published, and then they told, then they changed their tune, and their, they said, well, we feel like we can't really charge Diveroli without charging you because you were so heavily involved. All the emails are between you guys, so, uh, so we have to charge you. But because you pled guilty, and we're going to tell the judge that that uh, you're a changed person and that you are uh, you're a good boy now, and and uh, therefore the judge should give you the low end of the of the range yeah. of of what they could. So we I could have gotten up to five years in prison for this. Yeah. Yeah. Ended up getting just seven months of house arrest. Oh, well. really probably would, which is nothing. I mean, I feel very very fortunate to have avoided prison. Um, Devaroli probably could have gotten away with maybe a year in prison, maybe even less. But his big mistake was that he got entrapped into committing a second crime while awaiting sentencing. Of course. And, and because of that, his plea agreement was, was invalidated. And so the government wasn't required to tell the judge, because he pled guilty as well, eventually. Yeah. And so the, he wasn't, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, prosecutors weren't required by the plea agreement to go to bat for him, so to speak, uh, with the judge. And so they told the judge, this guy is unrepentant. He committed another crime while awaiting sentencing, you know, give him, throw the book at him. Uh, he, he got entrapped into, into handling a firearm by an undercover ATF sting. Uh, so, uh, so he could have gotten 10 years in prison. Yeah. Yeah. You really, the, my personal favorite Part of that whole story is right before he picks up the gun that the ATF, the, the ATF agent tricked him into picking up. He goes to the ATF, the undercover ATF agent. He's like, what can I say? Once a gun runner, always a gun runner. Uh, and he picks up the gun and the, then the ATF agent slams the, the, uh, the cuffs on him. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, so it was, uh, he could have gotten 10 years for that weapon. I was gonna say, yeah. I was gonna and say. plus another five years for the, for the ammunition fraud charge. So he could have gotten 15 years in prison in total, but he hired the best lawyers in Miami, spent millions of dollars and they negotiated yeah. hard and he ended up getting four years. So that's how he ended up getting. Four so years. I'm guessing if, well, a few things. So first is, um, you served your time and obviously doing other things. We'll get to that in a second yeah. before we wrap up. Um, you're not talking to Ephraim at all, I assume, right? No, we are very much not friends. I, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, so like to ask probative questions. Sure. Um, did you guys make a few bucks off the movie? Did you sell the rights? He sell the rights. How did that work? So I made some money off the movie. Okay. Not a lot, but not, not fifteen million. Yeah, but not guess. not fifteen million. Not even close. Uh, but not nothing. I, I yeah, really yeah, don't yeah. have too yeah. many complaints. Yeah. Um, not as much as Jonah Hill or Miles Teller made. I'll yeah, I was going to say. Was the guys say. pretending to be me made a lot more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> that's how hollywood works but um uh so yeah i i sold my life rights they call it yeah uh, they they actually didn't have to buy my life rights to make yeah. it because well, you're a public figure that kind of stuff. exactly i'm a public figure once yeah. you're in the papers they can make a movie about you using correct, your name correct, and say correct, whatever correct, they want correct, and, correct, and correct. the united states first amendment freedom yeah. of speech you can't sue them it's different in the uk you could sue them for life you should have sold your period rights because your story is yeah. not done brother yeah <laughs> we're gonna get to that we're gonna get yeah, to yeah. that thing yeah, thank down. you thank you well um, i have a yeah. different life now which I, um, i'm a lot more proud of god bless um, yeah so but he was in prison at the time and they didn't 
really feel like they wanted his side of the story because yeah. he's a notorious habitual liar. So yeah. it, it, they knew they wouldn't get the real story out of him anyway. And so, and they didn't want to deal with him in general. So they didn't buy it. So he didn't make any money off the movie, but he did sue them after coming out of the movie, claiming that they stole his, that they based it on the memoir that he wrote in prison with Matt Cox. Uh, uh, yeah. Which I believe the, the lawsuit was dismissed because when you read his book, it, it's nothing to do, like not even close to what. Now, now, now it's funny because uh, uh, I, I knew about it. I watched it before, but yeah. George is my partner on the show. Uh, said, you got to get David on. And he also wants to get Matthew Cox on as well. Yeah. The, the Matthew Cox is kind of a swindler. The Matthew Cox swindle Ephraim at all, as far as you know? or, or It actually went the other way. Ephraim swindled. Really? Yeah. The swindler got swindled. Jesus yes. Christ. I mean, you could talk to Matt about it, but it. I know that. Uh, Matt, I think Matt ended up suing Ephraim just like everyone else does because uh, Ephraim didn't want to pay him the money that he promised him for writing the book. As I said, Ephraim burns every bridge, every bridge, wow. even even with the guy who was writing about him burning bridges. He burned that bridge, too. <laughs> as yeah. he's on the bridge and, and as he's, he's on the bridge, bridge. writing, looking at all the other bridges burning, he's burning that one, too. Yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. So you obviously pivot. You get through this nightmare. Yeah, um, David's got some other stuff cooking, which is really, I know he's really proud of. Why don't yeah. you share with you know what you're working on now? Right. So, uh, so my current, uh, so I became after while I was under house arrest, I had the idea for a, uh, a hands-free drum machine called the Beat Buddy. Nice. It's like like your buddy that plays the beat. Because uh, I'm a musician, I play guitar, and uh, I really miss playing with the drummer. So I. Yeah. Uh, had this idea for a, a drum machine that you could use hands-free um, and control with your foot. So, and nobody else was making it. Nobody else had even patented the idea. So it took me three years, but eventually I got it built. It became very successful. And uh, the company is called Singular Sound. The product is called Beat Buddy. We've made uh, five additional musical products. You know, the world's most advanced looper, a MIDI controller. I, most people who aren't musicians don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But um, but the product that I'm most excited now about, uh, my latest product that I've created, is something that everyone can relate to. Uh, it's a machine that can floss all of your teeth for you in 10 seconds. And it's called InstaFloss. Yeah, that's that's the beat, buddy. That's wait, my wait, 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 wait. We got to get to that. I, I have a good friend of mine who owns like five yeah. dental practices. So we'll get that in a oh, second. Oh, yeah. So okay, this yeah. is, so this is my music company. You see the Beat Buddy is right there in the lower left corner. That's the first God product. God yeah, God that's God. that's the uh, it's um, the world's first hands free uh, controllable drum machine. The drum machine in a guitar pedal. That's the idea. That's insane. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wow, I'm going to check that out. And what's the other one? The other product is called InstaFloss. If you go InstaFloss.com or Insta like Instagram, but flossing. Uh, instafloss.com and yeah there it is instafloss so this was based on a water pick which is uh, has yeah. been around since the 70s it's a, the water pick uses a single stream of water that you have to trace your gum line top bottom inside outside of your teeth and it's kind of a real pain to use you have to take some skill to learn how to use it and it takes a little bit of time if you're doing Get it. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, exactly. So this is an improved version of that. Instead of one jet of water, it uses 12 jets. So you can do both the top and bottom rows of teeth at the same time, as well as the outside. Without the bleeding, because a water pick, you got to put that stupid thing in. Exactly. And and this, because of the way it's built, it holds the, the jet, uh, jets of water at a perfect 90 degree angle to the gum line, which is required if you're going to have a uh, effective floss. Because if you're aiming it into your gums, then it just irritates your gums. If you're aiming it away from your gums, it's not effective. So it's supposed to be at a 90 degree angle, which is actually very difficult to do if you're doing the inside of your mouth pointing outwards, which you're supposed to do both sides of your teeth. It's very difficult. So most people who use a water pick, they'll buy it, they'll try it, they'll spray their mirror, make a big mess, and then they'll put it under their sink and it just collects dust uh, for the rest of the time because they give up on it. This one, it take it doesn't require any skill to learn how to use. You just put it on your teeth and you sweep it across, and it does it all automatically for you. That's insane. When is it going to be? I see the pre-order. So when is yeah. it? Uh, so we are. In, we've been working on this for five years, yeah, and yeah. Uh, we just started the uh, first manufacturing run. So it's right at the finish line, which is yeah. why I'm doing all these podcast interviews because I'm uh, trying yeah. to uh, drum up interest and publicity yeah. for it. 
um, we're delivering the first units at the end of the year. So around December, November, December time, we're scheduled to deliver the first units. Love it. When you um, yeah. when you go um, live, let me know. I'll order one. And what I'll do is I'll order one for a giveaway Perfect. with our, um, yeah. with our, uh, our team here. Yeah. Wow, this is sure. fantastic, David. Yeah. I, you know, it was kind of last minute. I, I knew yeah. of David. I wanted yeah. to get him on. George kind of helped uh, set this up. Yeah. Uh, so David, one, how, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. One last thing. I apologize for interrupting oh, no you. Worries. One last thing I just want to say about the Insta Floss is that we are currently doing the equity crowdfunding campaign for it. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah. So, because we have so many back orders that we need additional funding to expand production. Why can't Ephraim give and you the money? I don't want to come. I don't even want to talk to him, let alone get involved with him in any sort I, of. Way. I was just kidding. <laughs> if you could, David, when you get a chance, email me the crowdfunding link. So, for those that are watching now, um, I'm yeah. going to put it on the description on the yeah. live, you know, the version that we release uh, as soon as the I links are the links yeah. should be on the website as well. Oh, well, let me see. Yeah, it should be there. If it's not there, then I have to talk to my web guy. You can see. So I go to the top. Hold on, get to the front. I see Instafloss news mm -hmm. pre-order. Let me just see. Let Meet Instafloss. Two time clean. What are we experts? Watch reactions. Better floss. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a digital guy. Yeah, I don't see the call to action for like, hey, oh, that is wanna... strange. Okay, there's some. Oh, there it is. Uh, there, it's like a pop up. Well, maybe reload the site. Um, there's usually when you load it for the first time, there's a pop up that says become a shareholder and with a learn more button. I just I see it on my screen, so uh, I don't know if it didn't. Show I'm, I'm gonna refresh. I'm gonna refresh. Hold okay. Right. Yeah. Didn't uh, didn't show up, huh? I might, have a, I might have a I might have a blocker because I'm like a weirdo with that stuff. But if you can, no worries. Send me the link. Yeah, I'll send you I'll the link. It, um, yeah, it's uh, republic.com slash instafloss forward slash instafloss. Republic.com. And it's an equity crowdfund? Really? It's a, this is an equity crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we did a like a standard crowdfunding campaign two yep. years ago, uh, which we raised uh, about two million dollars with. Nice. And yeah, so that went very well. And now we're just doing a equity crowdfunding campaign uh, to uh, to uh, be able to do larger production runs so we could get to retail faster. And you guys got a uh, 16, almost $16 million va uh, valuation. Correct. Oh, you're giving it, so you're giving a 20% discount on, the, on yep. the buy. Okay, nice. And then uh, let me just see. And then how much more of the round you need to go? So we uh, we're raising a two million dollar round. We've yeah. already raised eight hundred thousand. Got it. And then, so you want you know at least three hundred from this, and then you're, you're yeah. still going around and getting exactly. Um, I just, exactly. just one last question. So if I invest in this, it'll just parse off whatever my portion of whatever 085 percent share, whatever that right. is, and then you can go ahead and do it. That wow. Exactly. And you have pre and you have pre orders. I'm sorry. You guys have pre-orders? Yeah. Uh, so the pre-orders are for the actual product. Uh, yeah. So if you so you get like a discount, a hundred dollar discount, um, and we will deliver it, it at the end of the year. I love it. All right, listen. So um, I'm going to put the links below. David, thank you for being on the podcast. This is uh, something a little different, and I'm sorry to hear that all worked out. Worked out, but I told you your life rights are going to be very valuable because your <laughs> best days are ahead. And thank I'm you, thank you. I believe it as well. I appreciate right. it. God Thank bless. You. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Be well. Thank you. You too. Yeah.